This uh, roundtable will be shared by uh, Thibaut Neveu, entrepreneur, machine learning engineer, educator, more than 1 million of you in, on YouTube. Thibaut was previously part of Samsung Research America, who is a team where his team and him pushed robotics limits by delivering one of the first intelligent kitchen robots. Today, he is the co-founder of Visual Behavior, working on robotics future by pushing state-of-the-art for computer vision methods to real-world application. So he is also a strong contributor to, to, of uh, Actu AI, one of our historical media partners. So, Thibaut, bonjour. I give you the floor to present the member of the uh, roundtable. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So yeah, thank, thank you everyone being here for this front table on AI ethics, from theory to reality. It's a very important subject and that's sometimes we forgot to, to talk about. But as we're going to see today, this is something that, is, that has to be thinking from the right beginning when we develop an AI models. So today, we're not going to be able to go through all the details of what is AI ethics and all the challenge that we have with that. But we're going to try to talk about some important aspects that we have right now. Specifically, I'm thinking about the AI, e, the EU AI Act that is going on right now. There is a lot of questions around that, but also some practical questions on how do we really implement that? Where, where is the research right now in terms of concrete solution? And maybe we're going to finish with some philosophical questions if we do have time. But of course, we do have amazing guests today to talk about that. So, Rodrigo, maybe if, if, you, if you want to join from, from Amadeus, we also have François Regis as well, Aola Mala, and Ludovico Di Biagio. And we can maybe start with a quick one-minute presentation of, of every, everyone on this table. But yeah, Rodrigo, if you want to start, maybe. Okay, so I'm Rodrigo Acuña. I'm industrial engineer and as well PhD in computer science. So I'm I have two missions in my company I'm from Amadeus. So Amadeus is providing software and solution for the travel industry, for example, airlines and hotels, as well, okay, travel agents, for example. So my two missions in Amadeus is first, I'm leading the research department. That means uh, we deliver use cases for the business unit and as well exploration of emerging technologies. And my second mission is more to animate AI in the company. So as well, for example, defining the job families, talking to resource, uh, human resources or how to move forward and to increase the adoption. And one part of that mission is to, my mission is to disconnect Skynet, for example. Now I mean, so now I'm in charge of the AI ethics in the company. So to define what we're doing and how to align the human values to AI development. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm François Regis Martel the uh, Director of Development of the Acuristic Group and the uh, General Manager of all the foreign offices. Probably the oldest guy or girl in the group, which means that I started in 35 years ago, or 40, 50, at a time when it was not fashionable, I want to say sexy. Today, uh, it's a bit different from the other members of the panel. The other panelists, uh, we use automats. For us, artificial intelligence is, as in the past, uh, just the use of automats. And we'll see afterwards that in terms of ethics, that's fine to develop things for others who are responsible of ethical matters because you do not sell directly the output or even the software. We don't take the responsibility as such. Our activity is in geomatics, in the ground segments of satellite missions, so mainly engineering, so we use things. It should work. Okay. Well, I'm Paula Malat. I'm a research scientist at uh, SAP Labs France, part of the security research team. And I work particularly on the topic of trustworthy AI, where we explore different aspects, mainly the technical ones. So we, we try to address problems of fairness, explainability and privacy. And we also try to explore the interplay between these aspects to kind of build a comprehensive approach to ethical AI. We also try to support internal teams to address certain questions or concerns that they have about AI ethical consideration. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Ludovic Di Biagio. I'm a professor of economics at Schema Business School, which means that I'm not an expert in ethics. I'm more interested in everything related to innovations, but I also had the chance to coordinate 
Otesia, which was the observatory for the impact of artificial intelligence in different dimensions. And that gave me the, the opportunity to work with different disciplines and ethics was one of the core questions in the in the observatory. And then I was passionate, so I worked a bit and I visited Opia in Montreal. And also I attended several workshops and seminars with UNESCO on the ethics guidelines and the framework. So at least I will have more questions than probably answers, but this yeah. is why, why I'm here, right? Uh, so before we get started, I just wanted also to to thank a lot Geronimo Bernard Salas that was at the initiative of this roundtable, Olena Kushakuska, SAP. And maybe I'm just going to show for the subject today what I was talking about before, about the complexity that we have to implement AI safety, AI ethics into a, a machine learning AI pipeline because it starts from, from the data directly, but it's also part of the training. Then there is some decision about what exactly are we going to do with the trained models. And then there is some questions about how this model is going to be used in concrete application all the way to the final user where the model is going to be able to interact with it somewhat or take decision. That is some question that we we'll see today about that. But maybe we can start with some first questions about uh, concrete questions about how exactly in your companies you did it, did what did you do exactly in terms of AI ethics and what are some concrete things that, that are happening and what are the challenges? Maybe Rodrigo, if you want to start. Yes, yeah, sure. So AI at Amadeus is not just appears like that. It's, it has been a journey actually. We, we have been working on AI for 20 years when we started the first IT. And for that reason, we really have a strong ethical uh, principles that govern IT. And as well, we have legal department. Uh, for example, we are respecting GDPR. So what was the latest step uh, on top of that? So two years ago, we create and we formalize what we call the AI ethical principles because we believe that actually AI amplify these ethical concerns. And this, uh, we define very concrete six principles the first one is fairness, okay? So in order to avoid our biases, uh, reliability and robustness of the problem of, of, for example, accuracy and uh, hallucinations, safety and privacy as well. We have accountability, transparency, and sustainability. So that's our, our principal, yes, we also principal. And then last year, bef that was before ChatGPT, we had this ChatGPT that we call was a tsunami, but the difference with tsunami is that the wave is not coming back. So we were uh, at, we, we had now many uh, use cases that are coming. So we need to respond all this demand. We create on top new uh, stuff. So we create a new git get lines for generative AI applications. So we concrete black list and white list of tools and use case we can apply it for safe. And as well, we create a new core team we call a task force with multiple teams from legal, R&D, PNC, communications, when we review all different use cases in order to approve or give suggestion to be compliant with all our principles. So, so it seems you were already doing this initiative, right? As, I mean, three years ago already, even though that was not something that was mandatory. So my question is, what were the type of incentive that you had at Amadeus for starting this, this work? Okay, no, actually, two years ago was a challenge because it was like a more proactive way in, I was working in research. So we saw in conference for a moment all this uh, movement of uh, ethical AI. So it was a challenge to convince of management and the stakeholders as well the staff that this was something important. So two years ago was a challenge. But now that is, uh, they were happy that we defined that in the past. Now we need to move forward because that was like a more let's say suggestions. So now we need to be sure that it's going to be applied in order to respect, for example, the new regulations. So new regulation in that sense are helping us to move our ethical agenda inside of the company because now we have this sense of urgency that really moves all of the people. Yes. How did it, how did it happen exactly? Did you have a specific team specialized for making sure that every, everyone was following some guidelines or was it more something distributed across the company, like trying to talk to everyone about mm. the importance to take this into consideration? What was the process to implement that? So we start uh, small, 
as myself, I'm small. So we start uh, only myself with the uh, proactivity. Okay, we need to do something. Then we join forces with legal department. That's what very good because they are very good writing the correct text. What is the deadlines to be in a formal language of our company values? And now after that, with uh, ChatGP tsunami, we create a multidisciplinary team. It's composed by more than ten people. So we have legal, PNC, communication, R and D research, um, what else I'm missing, and business unit as well, because we need to, in any case, balance what the business needs against risk, because of the, or, or, otherwise the solution is we do nothing, and not, doing nothing is zero risk, but this is not what we are in for. So we need as well to put business unit disabled. This is what we need to, need to do, and the rest of the team is helping, supporting how we can make it happen. So that's the approach. So it starts is small and then it's growing. Or right, if you want to give your experience based on SAP, how you, you did that during the past years? In fact, SAP's commitment to ethical AI started uh, way before I joined the company. And it started off quite early, I would say, from 2018, I think, when they established a set of uh, guidance principles to define ethical AI. And it was shortly backed by an AI ethics policy that was endorsed by the uh, executive board and the work councils globally. So this policy's objective is to really, to really enforce these principles and not having them just theoretical, but just ensure that they are implemented in our operations. But we also more recently established what we call AI hand, the AI ethics handbook, which serves more as a practical guide for implementing and ensuring the AI ethics considerations in our products. So, and we also have, have an assessment process, an internal process under which all AI use cases should undergo. So it's a classification process. And then when certain use cases are classified as high risk, they go through a reviewing process with an AI ethics uh, steering committee, which is composed by experts from all over the company, so development, corporate strategy, HR, legal, and so on. And they help the, uh, the product team to really address certain concerns and provide guidance and decide on the continuity or not of the, of the product. You, you mentioned you, you do have some projects that are labeled high risk. Can you touch on that? Like, uh, what are the, when do you exactly define something as high risk and what are the different measure that you take in this type of situa situation? So in fact, the, this assessment process is publicly available and it's, it's a set of questions to which the uh, AI product team should, should answer to. And it's mainly when we use personal data and if the usage of personal data could, could be harmful according to a set of, set of standards that are uh, defined. So that so is it more on the data side, but is it also on the action capabilities side as well? So for the moment, it the the idea is that if it uses personal data, then the applications are are considered significant. So the implications could be on the individuals, but there are other. This is for the high risk classes, but there are prohibited use cases as well in which there are also defined standards that the use case shouldn't harm the society, the environment, and so on. I, I have some questions about, um, because we, we talk about uh, that things change since one year with the rise of ChatGPT foundation models. It's both a lot of new data to, to end up larger than before, even larger than before. Same for the models. So my question is, did it change something specifically during, the, does, some, does something change during the last year because of that? For more... From a practical aspect, we see a lot of interest from different teams in AI to address these concerns. So a lot of awareness about the ethical considerations compared to before, before the surge of ChatGPT. But also the, our AI ethics policy is being updated now. So there will be a, a new version that is going to be released sometime soon, where it takes into consideration all the progress that happened recently. So foundation models and uh, general purpose AI and so do you have some example of one thing that was not here before that, I mean, that you were not considering before that, but that you do have to consider right now that we have those big models because you updated the policy. So I don't know if you, if there are some specific things that change. The problem is that with this, with this very advanced models, the, the playground becomes very complex. 
So it's it's sort of a mess, I would say now. But oh, you wanted to? Yeah, maybe I can complement on that. For example, one one aspect that is completely new is the IP aspect, because generative AI. What is new is you are generating, creating new content. So the question becomes: Okay, fact. The first question is: If you are putting in the prompt some proprietary information that is going to be shared with external provider, so it's one concern, and this is what is inside of our policy. And as well, the other side, the output of these tools is that uh, is this content already have some IP, so property of uh, anyone else. For example, a new picture, maybe artists could say, this is my picture and you are, the, I have a copyright on this. And this is completely new compared more to traditional AI, what is more concerned on the bias and the input data and so on. The IP aspect, I think, is quite uh, new. Yeah, and even the, the fact that those models are so big that they can memorize, I mean, some information on directly, uh, give them to the users. There is also some lot of concern about that. Maybe we can move as well to, because if this is a big topic right now about the European AI Act and specifically the impact that there is for companies. Maybe Ludovic, if you want to, to comment on that specifically on the, what are the benefits and maybe the opportunities that there is for companies in Europe with this act. Yeah, sure. In fact, I think that the AI Act is something that everybody needs and that we can see that the principles are very useful to see to what extent we can apply those principles in, in actual evaluation assessment. And uh, so the benefit, I think, is that the, the approach, the risk approach, gives an assessment based on impact, effect, not a priori robustness of, uh, of models. And so the models are not evaluated per se, but in the, in the context. However, one of the questions we can ask is uh, to what extent it provides a useful tool to be implemented and what are the contingencies where it makes it difficult. And I think that there are different dimensions that we should question, and in particular when we apply them. The first is to what extent the, 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 the system leave autonomy of decisions to, to individuals, to people. And so here we have different levels of autonomy from full autonomy where people are completely conscious of the risk or of everything and then they, they can still decide up to the complete autonomous decision of the machine. And so that's so uh, one, one important question is that what are the type of risks and where we can allow some kind of loss of autonomy in decision making. And in this respect, we have to think about two types of problems. One is the one that you, our colleagues mentioned, is the, all the problems that are based on principles and to what extent we can assess the, 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 the risk of violating some of the principles. Okay? However, that's when I read some papers where you can see clearly that the, the, the risk evaluation is very broad and the classifications of cases into risks may be too general to, to give a, proper, a precise element. And that was very well noticed, for instance, uh, yesterday by uh, Battista Biccio or Gianluigi Bagnoli from SAP when he said that we really have to evaluate the risks in the very context-specific applications. i just give you an example. So insurance companies created a con consortium to see to what extent the AI Act could be applied to evaluate their risks to fix prices and the, the capability to, to, in, uh, to, to, to guarantee the, the insurance. And what they found is that the clustering is so broad that uh, the, 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 the number of risk, uh, risk is, tends to be very high, and therefore there will be a lot of discriminations and, and, and maybe even excludability of people. And therefore what they say is that we have to redefine those risks in the context of applications to uh, estimate the actual risk. So that's the first dimension, but that, that can be worked. And what, what is nice is what I can hear is that a lot of assessment is really based on use case. However, what we can see is that when you, when you, you there is a more general purpose AI, like uh, generative AI, for instance, it's extremely difficult to identify all potential use cases and evaluate the risk in each potential use case. And when we go for what has been explained for low code, no code, where it's open source, so yes, it becomes more transparent in the process, but anticipating what is going to be done with the, the, the system is, is very difficult. But, and the last, maybe not least, is the second order problems, is that we are defining those criteria, those, uh, those principles based on values 
beliefs, preference. And we know from the very long time that technology changes our beliefs, change our evaluations. That's what we were a bit saying, right? Let me just give you an example. With ChatGPT, the concept of creativity and authenticity of creativity has changed. And before we, we all understood what was a piece of art. And today the capacity to sell a piece of art generated by a machine, is it considered as an art or not? And we see that the move. Another dimensions of creativity, as you said, is patenting. Okay? To what extent we have to change our conceptions of copyright and IP protections, and to what extent we can think of a pattern generated or partly generated by an AI. So we can see that the, our value, our, our considerations of what is behind the principle is, is, not, is not fixed in time. And do we have agency? Do we have the capacity to decide about it? Okay. So, or do we have a system, conversation systems where several people, citizens can discuss about it and, uh, and not just be reactive and just accept the, the, the evolution pushed by technology? Yeah, so, I mean, for, so thank you for this insightful sharing. But I mean, I, I think there is a lot of questions uh, after that. Maybe, but maybe Francois Regis, if you want to to give your opinion as well on this question. Well, first of all, in our cases, uh, we are part of the three cases except exemptions from the from the applications of the act. In the sense that there are three exemptions: military and security purposes, scientific research, and when it's fully open source, except for foundation models and large language and natural languages and so on. And fortunately for us, we're in scientific research and we deliver always open source models, which allow us in some way not to be under, well, not to be under, legally under the act. But we're speaking of A6 because I have a few things today. We were speaking of A6, but we are speaking also of problems of IPRs and so on that are not A6, related to A6 but are legal, which is not the same thing. So in some ways, the Act, the European Union Act, reminds us nonetheless that we're speaking of ethics, moral principles, which are not automatically enforced by laws, but they can, because let's say we are in, we are in countries where the principles, the moral principles, often are more important even than the legal principles or they are behind. So we have to apply, but we're not obliged to register models. We're not obliged to have the proper documentation and so on. So the question in some way for companies that are exempted is whether they should nonetheless do as if or not. However, in our cases, for me and as a matter of principle, if everything was open, but even ChatGPT open, it's difficult to find out what's doing and what it's del it delivers. If everything is open, we no longer have any problem in some way with the EU the Act. You don't have to apply it because you apply it as per the exemption. Well, so I think I mean to, uh, to when I'm thinking about what you said about trying to regulate at the application levels and what you're saying about opening foundation models and open open sourcing them. I mean I see a lot of issue that could arise with open sourcing those models. I mean we there is some good example right now with. Grok AI from, from X that did their own foundation models. Uh, so it's not a print source, but they did decide on their own on their side to not align the AI in the same way. So they decided that it's okay for the AI to talk about uh, everything. Some other person just release them. Meta choose to release them in open source. And I, I, I also, we also know in, in the French community right now that new startup like Mistral decided as well to open source them, open source those models. So I'm not quite sure, and I think this is a big debate that we have right now, where exactly do we want to put the measure? Because I think that currently in the EU AI Act, the regulation are on the foundation model itself. And for companies like Mistral that are new startups in the field, it looks like a very big constraints in terms of competition and in a lot of administrative tasks that some startup can't really afford. So yeah. What is maybe, if, if some of you want to share your thought on that, on this very huge administrative process that could be applied on smaller companies? You know, okay, I think there are two ways to see. If you are thinking that this regulation is like a cost, 
and you try to avoid to apply because I'm in a deception or not. This is one way, yes, it's a cost, but as well could be an opportunity. What is the opportunity is the, the European companies to be competitive in the moral step. I don't know, if you are a user and you have to choose between product A and B, and A is respecting this very strong regulation, it gives us a commercial advantage to sell this product in the world. So this is one of the opportunities I see. So uh, trust from the customer, adoption, and uh, for example, in our case, we are an international company o uh, operating in all the world in the B2B. So it's kind of have like a certification that what we are doing is fine. And even we want to be further than that. And another opportunity is because of all this regulation, we need to have a catalog of models and data. This is to have a lot of value internal in the company in order to uh, optimize the efficiency. For example, if we know that this similar use case in our catalog is being done by another team, we are going to redirect people, for example. So I think at the end, this has more opportunity than cost. And if we are doing better than other part of the world, it's going to make uh, Europe uh, stronger in the market. So, well, maybe I'm too optimistic and naive, but uh, I think it's a good way to see it. I totally agree with you with the fact that within Europe we'll make this differentiation if we deliver foundation models that are ethical and, and responsible. But my personal view of, around the negotiations that are happening with the AI AU Act, I think regulating just at the foundation model doesn't really prevent us or protect us from the risks that are related to the technology. So it is not enough. And I think regulation at the application level should be enforced. And because you earlier said these ethical considerations are very dependent on the context and, and, and the sector, and you cannot do that at the foundation model level. So I think regulating foundation models it is good, it is positive to start off from already a good start, to not perpetuate further all these risks, whether it be it discrimination or lack of privacy and so on. But I don't think it should be an obligation because later on, if the regulation at the application level will be enforced, it can somehow, these risks that will be brought by the foundation model could be mitigated at the application level. Yeah, I, I will compliment because uh, I'm afraid I'm a bit less optimistic than Rodrigo. But uh, just because uh, there are problems, as I said, of time, about values and also of space. And the question is to what extent it affects competition. So that's uh, something important. So when I, what I mean by that is that I agree that even if it's not by law that you have to comply with certain principles when it's open, but at the end of the day, the question you are talking about privacy, for instance, the meaning of privacy have evolved over time. So 30 years ago, privacy was almost secrets about your private life, right? Whereas today, we can we can clearly see that privacy is more about the con control of the information flow, etc. But also, those elements are very different across continents and cultures. And therefore, applying a fixed and unanimous or universal principle is very difficult. And at the end of the day, the question is that there are externalities that is, those, if, if all the European countries have to comply with certain rules, and that's the question, is that to what extent it's not constraining for innovations and competition. So when we t we, you talk to scholars, but also companies, accessing data is difficult. And it's much more difficult to access data in Europe than in the United States. And therefore, the question is that, and I don't, I don't say we should not have privacy concerns, but the question is, at the end of the day, what is going to be the result if the American models remains upfront just because they have more access to more data? And so I could develop this because it's not only about AI, but all the ecosystems. And we know the, the, the problems for accessing the, the clouds and cloud services, etc. So it's all the, the value chains that matters. So somehow we can think about uh, the AI Act as a guideline, a framework, but to what extent and where is the limit where we have, we force companies to comply. And I think this is the challenge. And I think no one has the, the, the right answer, but I think this is the core of the debate. Yeah, because there is, a, I mean, there is a lot of concerns that because we are already late in Europe with respect to AI compared to the US or 
RTS, there is some concern exactly that we're, we're maybe it, it's going to enforce that so we're going to be even more late than we than we were before. How was said yesterday, I think, is that the the, the, the we are late, maybe not because we are not able to make to 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 make as uh, powerful algorithms and systems, but maybe because of size and access to data and the ability to scale up. So that that's that's the real concern is to to what extent. Uh, regulations becomes a barrier to entry more than than just uh, a framework to 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 make it more ethical. So for you, it would be about exactly how to handle the other countries into the AI Act, so that every, everyone yeah. is aligned on the. That, that's why I think that the initiatives by OECD, the, like the GPIA, or the, the the initiative by UNESCO, the the World Economic Forum, are crucial because that's where Europe can have. A voice because they have they are we are way in advance. The, I think the, China is the only country that that really uh, went very forward in regulation. But I think we have a voice, and it is very important to establish principles that are shared across countries. And and that's where the only way we can we can so going beyond Europe, but are trying to be to do it. I think so. But I think that's what they do actually. Because I I guess that also for doing it worldwide, there is also some questions about how does research keep up with those very large models because if we have to establish guidelines we also have to make sure that we have the right tools so that everyone in the world can can use them and so maybe a, a question for for you Aola on exactly what are the type of how does research keep up with those type of regulations uh, what are the tools that we have for applying AI ethics so so AI ethics it's not a new topic it had been it's they started exploring this topic a long time ago, but it really sparked with all the scandals that made it to the media about risk, risk of bias and discrimination, about privacy issues and so on. And actually with the mass adoption of AI solutions. So that really sparked the attention in terms of research and trustworthy and ethical AI. Uh, but even for narrow AI, if we could call it like that, we are still lagging behind in terms of state of the art so we don't we're not really there we we are lacking guys metrics and tools to assess these risks and and mitigate them and especially uh, frameworks that are more com comprehensive so it looks at the problem considering different aspects at a time and of course with the uh, with large language models it didn't help at all it's just complicated the the playground and it posed many more challenges. So there are some efforts currently in research uh, where there are some solutions that are being extended from traditional or narrow AI, I would say, but mostly for downstream tasks, so not for general purpose AI. And there are other solutions that are more on the practical side that consist more of prompt engineering, for instance. But that's why it's very, very important to invest in research and to foster. So I guess if you wanted to... Yes, just to add one thing, the EU AI Act is about rules, but uh, you don't have any rules to assess the risk the way they have classified things are related to the potential impact, not of the content of the work. Well, potential impact, education, critical infrastructure, transport, and so on. So it's not related to AI as such. So my question will, is, when I read that, I say, okay, we've got rules. How am I protected? Because when I've got rules, it is either to protect the consumers, to protect the people, or it is pro pro to protect the providers. If it is to protect the providers, it's legal. It means I'm protected because I'm certified. Will, be, will I be protected legally if I'm certified? If, uh, let's say, a self-driving car kills somebody, the fact that I'm certified does it protect myself in court? No idea. I'm sure that that's not the case. Then we've got the problem of the cost of being certified because there is an obligation, like the ISO thinks, but usually it's because your customer wants you to be certified. It's in some way, it's not a marketing thing, but it's related to just trade, nothing related to ethics in some way. But, right. so, but you think that the current regulations are more about protecting the provider instead of providing protecting the culture? I don't know. At the moment, the only thing I can say is, let's say most of these rules, my feeling, are just forcing the suppliers, the people that use the AI system, to think about what they're doing. 
which is in some way at the end, even if we've got regulations enacted by the European Parliament, it is in the hands. At the end, it is in the hands of the suppliers. It is self-assessment. I may be wrong. I think you are absolutely right, except that that's the, on the only way we, we, we know how to do the, this kind of evaluations. If you take, for instance, security in war, it's always going from rules uh, and maybe law to standards, and that's always to see responsibilities in case of accident. What you are saying is, is probably relevant is that does it apply to AI? Because maybe it's not a, a just a matter of responsibility, but a, a matter of prevention, and that's much, much more complicated. And, uh, and indeed, that's why I think it is a process. You, you, we have seen how long it is to implement the, the AI Act or even to agree about it. Because based on a use case uh, and applications, the, 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 the confrontations of value, but also the difficulty to apply emerges. And what I've seen at UNESCO, for instance, that they are working a lot with companies and with uh, data scientists to see how it can be implemented end of the day, I don't think they will solve what you're saying, which is a, a serious question indeed. So we're going to have to conclude this round table before to, to turn to the public for some questions. But maybe for a very last question and conc some conclusion word is, as we have so see today, there is a lot of things under AI ethics. But if there is only one that you would select being the, being the most important one, which one would it be? Okay, so I just list the six principles in Amadeus for all of them. Uh, I will select uh, fairness because, for example, transparency is like a global need. Everyone understand, okay, they need to explain if you get the, the credit for your house or not or whatever. The sustainability as well, everyone can understand. But the fairness is more complicated because we are blind or biased. And because we are all in Europe or, or will consume ChatGPT in English, we are not aware of what these models are not performing in other market, and it's very hard to be uh, aware of our bias. For example, two, day, two days ago, ago, I was in Athens, in Greece, and I learned that, for example, in ancient Greece, they mix wine with water, okay? And that was the high quality. Is if you only have only wine, was bad quality. Imagine we have an AI model that is able to predict the quality of wine and we measure the quantity of water for that in here. At least I'm from Chile, so that's completely forbidden to put water. I don't know you in French, but anyway, so that I, I was completely unaware of that. And because of, for example, the many data of this language model are coming from Wikipedia, you know that 60% 60% of articles talking about your companies have factual mistakes. 60%, it's not only, it's not 1% too. So all these bias are in these models. So this is, I think, is more hard and the one I will choose. Okay, I have the same view about the fact that uh, artificial intelligence in some way is amplifies all the human biases. So the problem is in some way not to correct them. I don't believe we can particular people that when they grow old, they have more and more biases. So the problem is, is there is in some ways to be open, is transparency, on the contrary, is to be able in some ways, things shall be open for the citizens, the users and so on, to understand what's being done and being able to test and value the biases. Otherwise, we're just cheated as consumers. We just manipulate it. So that's the reason why I may use the word transparency in a different way. I would say open and being available for assessing all the biases that, come, that can come out of these systems. I, I do agree with you on the aspect of transparency and, and even particularly on explainability. So if we enable explainability in AI, AI models, we could really debug the model or get a deeper understanding of its behavior in, in different aspects, I would say. So if we provide enough transparency and for the users and, and thus explainability as well. I think if the user is, we also have to address fairness, but if the user feels concerned that maybe this decision had been biased and according to the explanations that have been provided, then I guess the user could could flag that, that decision or could, could ask more for human intervention on that decision per se. Also, explainability has the has a capability to 
also identify malfunctioning in AI models, be it privacy, like security or privacy vulnerability, for instance, is an, an mm. bias as well. So I think, yeah, I would go for transpar transparency and explainability. So very quickly, because I think we are running out of time, but I will go in the very different directions because after two, two days, three days, what I realized is that there are a lot of concern by people doing, working on models inside companies. And I think that what the, the OpenAI case tells us what happened recently, tells us that somehow AI exposed us to a very significant question, which is what is the role of companies in society? And so maybe, I don't know, I mean, ideally we could question this utilitarian view of firms that is to maximize the shareholder value, but to what extent it is not time to discuss within company about the, the role of firms in society more extensively. And I know it's not for tomorrow that these discussions will be at the priority level in companies, but I think that AI somehow obliges us to face this problem and to what extent we have to consider, reconsider the role of corporations in, in society. Thank you very much.